I have the privilege this morning of introducing Rahim Fazal, our commencement speaker. Rahim is a technology entrepreneur, a doer, a dreamer, and an ardent follower of Emerson's dictum to always go where there is no path and blaze a trail. He's been named one of top 30 entrepreneurs under 30 by Inc. Magazine, one of top 40 under 40 by San Francisco Business Times, and one of the top 25 digital thought leaders by iMedia. He was the youngest student ever accepted into his MBA program without a prerequisite undergraduate degree, and was invited to the White House to receive an impact award from Startup America and the Kauffman Foundation. During his high school junior year, Rahim juggled double duty as an international baccalaureate student and one of the most promising part-time employees at McDonald's, at least in his eyes. Unfortunately, his manager didn't feel the same way, so he was fired for poor performance. Realizing that it was time to find his real passion in life, Rahim and his best friend Hussein decided to start a company helping businesses set up web pages, which out of fear of punishment, they kept secret from their parents. The site grew to more than 25,000 customers and was sold for $1.5 million during his senior year exams. The pair started a second business and listed it on the stock exchange, making Rahim at the time the youngest director of a publicly traded company in America. After graduating from business school, Rahim moved to Silicon Valley to start Involver, a social media company that brought the first marketing applications into Facebook for Fortune 500 brands like Nike, Best Buy, Target, and MTV. Involver was a founding member of Facebook's preferred developer program and the platform Facebook chose to power its most high-profile marketing activities, including the Super Bowl, Olympics, World Cup, and 500 million user milestone. In the summer of 2012, Rahim and his team sold Involver to Oracle, one of the world's largest technology companies. Today, Rahim is an executive at Oracle and travels around the world helping customers evolve into modern marketers. He mentors and invests in startups and advises early stage venture firms, nonprofits, and organizations such as the US Chamber of Commerce and the Stanford Peace Innovation Lab. Rahim's proudest and most enjoyable achievement over the last 10 years has been helping thousands of high school and college students join the adult world on their own terms. He lives in San Francisco with his fiance Priya and travels to Vancouver as much as he can to see his parents and challenge his sister Nora into spelling contests. I would like to welcome this year's commencement seeker, Rahim Fazal, to the podium. Wow, this is beautiful. My graduation took place in an ice rink. <laughs> Seriously, it took place in an ice rink. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am so honored to be receiving this honorary diploma from Harker. What? Sorry? <laughs> Get out of here. Seriously? Can't. Uh, I was uh, just informed that I will not be receiving a diploma from Harker. Um, but uh, I am here now, and uh, so thank you for having me. Today is a huge day. Today is a day that you will remember for the rest of your lives. It is your day of freedom. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Let freedom reign. <laughs> Several months ago, in preparation for this speech, I was invited to Harker to spend some time on campus. Naturally, with Harker being among the most elite private schools in the country, I was pretty excited and told everyone I knew. The first stop at arriving at your school was a boardroom, where a Michelin star chef served us a menagerie of delectables, including organic wild salmon on a bed of crisp greens that was foraged just that morning. To end our meal, we of course had pie. 
which I was told was confiscated from the more exclusive student dining room. <laughs> from what I understand, you are being punished for not cleaning up after yourselves. <laughs> and therefore not entitled to a dessert after your 17 course fixed menu. <laughs> that is okay. I ate all of your desserts and they were delicious. After lunch, we had a hot stone massage by Mr. Nikloff, <laughs> followed by lemon tea and gluten-free cake. I mean, this is Harker. Punctuated by several short classes, with, uh, which along with the hot stone massage is where the idea for this speech was inspired. By the way, parents, this is what a typical day looks like for your kids. You are missing out. It is a resort over there. <laughs> Students, my brothers and sisters, I remember sitting in a similar seat a little over 10 years ago. The sun was shining outside because it was in an ice rink, but the sun, I presume, was shining. The birds were chirping. My friends were texting me pictures of cats. And I was wondering, what will my next chapter look like? What kind of car will I be driving? <laughs> what does my dad mean when he asks, when exactly are you getting off my payroll? <laughs> and most importantly, what am I going to do with my life to achieve greatness? Let me tell you confidently, it will all work out. There are many paths to success. There is, however, one thing that will stand in your way of success, one thing that will rob you of joy and deprive you of your full potential, one thing that will try and force you off the uncharted path and onto the presumably safe, conservative, unfulfilling, everyone is doing it, so I should too path. And that is fear. Sure, we've all experienced fear. I don't mean the obvious fear, like the fear of heights or the fear of bald people. <laughs> I mean the fear. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Just, just saying. Uh, nice job covering it up with the hats. Uh, <laughs> I mean the fear that makes you forget there are many paths in life. Let me tell you three short stories about fear on my path to success. The first is called, Crying Like a Baby in Your Living Room. I'll never forget the moment. I was on the floor, curled up into a little ball, my parents sitting on the sofa next to me, trying to figure out what the heck was going on with their son the dot-com millionaire. Two years earlier, my best friend Hussein and I sold our website. I was in senior year, and we didn't grow up with a lot of wealth. But now, it seemed we had it all. Money, fame, a silver Honda Civic <laughs> that we shared, <laughs> because we are Indian. After we sold the business, we had a lot of options for using that money. We could have put that money into attending a top-tier school. We could have given it to our parents for safekeeping. Instead, we decided that we would start another business so we could turn that money into more money. But now, laying at my parents' feet in the living room, feeling weak and miserable, crying like a Disney princess, everything had fallen apart. We'd put all the money we had into this business and we couldn't find any customers. Not only did we not make any money, we had lost most of what we had in the first place. 
my mom looked at me, gave me a hug, and said, it's okay. Everything will be okay. We love you, and we will always take care of you. You will always have a roof over your head. You will always have enough. Passion had sparked the first company. Fear had dominated the second. The fear of not having enough. Whether you come from money or not, you will most likely face this fear at some point in the future. For most of you, this fear will present itself as you figure out what you want to do in life. You may feel you need to choose a career that pays you the most money. But what if this money doesn't make you happy? What if the money goes away? Do not make the mistake of choosing money over passion. Go goals fueled by money limit potential. Goals fueled by passion find cures to life-threatening diseases. Goals fueled by passion create technologies that improve the quality of life of people in the developing world. Goals fueled by passion create works of art that inspire generations. Goals fueled by passion build legacies. My mistake was thinking that money was the only path to happiness. Do not make the same mistake. There are many paths to success. My second story is called, Please Take Me Home. I am a really, really, really smart student, and my teachers say I am a joy in the classroom. <laughs> this cannot be possible. Standing in my kitchen, looking at six letters scattered across the table, the seventh in my hand, all starting with the same version of the sentence, thank you for your application. However, we regret to inform you, we are unable to offer you admission into the fall semester. Unbelievable. After taking a few months off, after losing my money in the startup, I decided to apply to college and develop my mind. My expectation was that I could choose any school I wanted to go to. I was smart and had built two companies. All seven colleges I applied to rejected me. It turns out, colleges care about grades. <laughs> you see, mine were good, but they weren't great because I was focused on building my school, my, my business in senior year of school. Now, not once in my life had I been rejected. Sure, maybe by a few girls, just a few, a dozen, <laughs> hundred, but never academically. And here I was with seven rejection letters. Several weeks later, I reached out to one of my mentors. I was feeling down and needed help badly. He encouraged me to take my ego and crush it under my foot. I mean, he literally said, take it and you put it under your foot and you crush it like a walnut. <laughs> it might have been one of your dads, I don't know. <laughs> then he said, apply to community college. Transfer to one of the bigger schools after a few years. Community college. My short-sighted mind was buzzing with negative stereotypes and ignorant judgments like, you know who goes to community college? Drug dealers. <laughs> no way, that's not me. My parents might have thought I was selling drugs, but I wasn't. I was selling websites. <laughs> I was an international baccalaureate student. I was an entrepreneur. In September, I started my first semester at community college. My class list read intro to accounting, intro to economics, 
intro to business, and intro to computers. I had started two freaking businesses in the field of computers. <laughs> Surprisingly, college was amazing. I worked hard and I learned a lot. At the end of the first semester, my business instructor took me aside. She recognized my potential and gave me her ticket to a dinner that night for her college's alumni event. The dean was going to be there. So I went to the dinner dressed in my best suit and tried to talk to all the old guys I could find. <laughs> there was one old guy standing by himself who turned out to be one of the school's biggest donors. He introduced me to the dean and I told her my story. Guess what? She invited me to her hotel the next day for lunch. Sorry, for, <laughs> for lunch. <clears throat> for lunch, my friends. <laughs> After our meal, the dean said she wanted me at her university. I remember her saying, I don't think you'd be a great fit for our undergrad program. I think you'd be a better fit for our MBA program. My jaw dropped. Six months later, after a lot of rigorous testing, I became the youngest person in the school's 80-year history admitted into the MBA program without an undergraduate degree. You see, my fear of rejection almost crippled me. Had I not squashed my ego like a walnut <laughs> and been in search for that one yes, after no, after no, after no, after no, I would not be standing in front of you today. I've learned rejection is a gift, a gift that presents you with an opportunity to imagine new possibilities. Each of you is immensely talented. Each of you has gifts beyond measure. Each of you will at some point face the fear of rejection. You may feel you're not good enough or smart enough or worthy of success because you tried, you put yourself out there, and you got shut down. When your fear of rejection hits, when that voice deep inside of you says it's impossible, that there's no point in even trying, that you should settle for a job or a career or a relationship that's not worthy of your wonderfulness, you must put your ego aside and unleash your creativity. When you think creatively, you will begin to see the world where my sister says, walls, hurdles, challenges, and boundaries are not permanent. They may not even exist. When you think creatively, you solve problems by asking yourself, what is another way of looking at this situation? What am I seeing? What am I missing? Creativity spurs action. Fear creates paralysis. Without creativity, the school your brother or sister or best friend is going to becomes your only option. Without creativity, the career everyone tells you you should pursue becomes your only option. Without creativity, those jeans, those standard straight leg, five pocket blue jeans are your only option for pants. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, creativity will open doors for you that you never before thought existed. There are many paths to success. The last story is called, wait, this is a joke, right? Am I on live TV? 
My face was flushed red. The walls were caving in. My life was going up in flames. I wanted to throw up. In fact, I think I did a little bit. My investors called me into a meeting. When I got there, they said they wanted a new CEO. In other words, they wanted someone who had more experience. Five years earlier, I had moved to Palo Alto and started Involver with a few friends. We wanted to make advertising better on Facebook. After hustling every day and catching a few breaks, Involver was used by more than a million companies, including some of the world's largest, even Facebook itself. The company was growing rapidly. I considered myself a pretty, pretty good CEO. But before I knew it, I'd made mistakes. Some big mistakes. We were spending extra money and not collecting it from our customers fast enough. I had made some bad hires. Things were moving so fast, I didn't even have time to ask for help. As I sat in the boardroom, overcome with grief and self-loathing, I figured my dreams of being a Silicon Valley CEO were over. Everything I'd worked so hard for, my life, my career, my identity, would never be the same. I was a failure. While I helped look for a new CEO, I continued to run the company. My anxiety was buoyed by anger and a determination to prove myself. Given the constraints, I pushed myself as a leader more than ever thought possible. I got the company back on track. I eventually hired a new CEO, trained him, and together we sold Involver to Oracle, where it continues to play a foundational role in a fast-growing business unit. My fear of failure made me tell myself I was bad at my job because I made mistakes. My fear of failure prevented me from asking for help when I needed it because I didn't want to admit I didn't know everything. My fear of failure made me work so hard to overcome these destructive stories about myself that I lived in perpetual stress. And worse, I shoved aside everything else important in my life, my health, my spirit, my relationships. So over the last two years, I've worked harder on conquering my fear of failure by being kinder to myself. I focused on eating healthy and going to the gym three times a week. You can probably tell. <laughs> I've begun to meditate regularly and spend time with teachers who have helped me see my soul. I've rediscovered love and joy for my family. My mom, my dad, my sister. We even traveled to my parents' birthplaces in East Africa. They hadn't been in 40 years. Six months ago, I took a sabbatical from Oracle. I had ventured through 11 countries, starting in Italy, where I proposed to my girlfriend. She said yes. Through vulnerability and admitting my fears, I've built deep, lasting relationships with friends, future colleagues, and investors. I've learned to ask them for help when I need it, and they do the same with me. Most relevant at this present moment, this experience has given me a chance to talk to you, the class of 2014, on one of the most important days of your life so far to share with you lessons that are real and all too common instead of another Silicon Valley success story. One of the hardest fears to face is the fear of failure. Some of you may be facing this fear now. 
Some of you may have faced this fear at Harker and maybe even become BFFs with it. Some of you may face this fear when you think about trying something new, building a new social group, taking some time off to travel, falling in love, not asking your parents for money? Or how about attempting to achieve a goal so audacious that you just know you're setting yourself up for mistakes? Mistakes are okay. Mistakes are life's way of telling you that you're trying hard enough. Mistakes are part of the process because the process is far more enjoyable, far more enriching, far more important than the product. You know you're good at getting A's. Now have fun doing it. My friends, over the next five years, you will begin to truly grapple with the question I addressed at the beginning. What will I do with my life to achieve greatness? You probably have some ideas, but are mostly unsure. That is perfectly okay. Thanks to your family, your teachers, and your hard work, I can confidently say that you are prepared to achieve greatness. Along your journey, do not fear you need more money. Set goals fueled by passion. You will always have enough. Along your journey, do not fear rejection. Your creativity will find even better solutions that you never before thought existed. Along your journey, do not fear failure. Celebrate your mistakes. Be kind to yourself. Enjoy the ride. Along your journey, pay attention. If you hear yourself saying, I want to do something important, but I'm not sure what that is, so I'm going to take the conventional path, remember, there are many paths to success. Your fear will push you to take a conventional path because of safety, prestige, comfort, or the notion that by pursuing this path, you will just figure it all out. The reality is, the conventional path will just delay you. The unbeaten path will make you feel alive every day. Harker, class of 2014, I ask you, what could you achieve if you had no fear? Congratulations, my friends.